Hi, I'm Garen Jones, and I went from rags to riches, and I'm one of the passionate few. The interview was fire because I got to go deep, and I got to share. Anytime I get the opportunity to share uh, my truth and anything I overcame, I already know that there's some people out there that's gonna receive it and say, you know what, me too. And you don't have to go to prison to be in prison in your mind and you just got the keys to unlock your own jail cell. So I'm so grateful to, to, to be on this platform and I can't wait till y'all hear it. Welcome to this episode of The Passionate Few. Today we get to hear the incredible rags to riches story of multimillionaire, serial entrepreneur, real estate investor, and transformational coach, Garen Jones. But before Garen was any of those things, Garen is somebody who had his life in shambles. As Garen grew up in a rough situation with his father who was murdered when he was a kid, dealt with his own addictions of drugs and alcohol, found himself hanging with the wrong crowds, and even was put in jail. And of course, in this interview, more so than the business side, we get into the mindset that allowed Garen to turn it around. And Garen talks about in this interview how he attributes much of his success to reading the power of positive thinking over 300 times and not just reading the book, but applying it to a T. Garen also talks about how one night when he hit rock bottom and his car got repoed and he found himself six figures in debt, he got out of his car and screamed out to the heavens that he wanted to make his life work no matter what. And it was at that very moment where he ran into a beggar on the street who told him that in order to change his life, he had to change his mindset first. So in this interview, we get into Garen's entire story focused on how he turned positive thinking into a source of fuel that is now inspiring millions around the world to do the same in their life. So I want to encourage you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this powerful interview that will help you change your mindset and change your life with Garen Jones. Enjoy. Thanks for being on the show, Garen. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, my man. So let's talk about your story. Some people know about you, some people don't. But can you talk to me a little bit about the success you've had and sort of the childhood that uh, led to where you're at today? Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for having this kind of platform for people who've had my sto- my kind of story and so that I can give it away. Because I, 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 As I've been around lots of people, a lot of people don't like to share their past and that vulnerable state. Right. You're a person that actually can put that out. So now I will be the voice of the voiceless for so many people. So I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for that. I appreciate that, my man. It's an honor to have you on as well. Yeah, thank you. So uh, in terms of my childhood, um, are we allowed to curse? Yes. (laughs) I had a fucked up time. (laughs) No, my childhood was crazy. I didn't know I was. I didn't know how crazy it was because I thought everybody lived the same way that I lived. I thought everybody um, had the conversation growing up. We don't have any money. We don't have any money. We don't have. No, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. So in my in my mind, everybody is living like that. Everybody is going to juvenile for breaking into cars and figuring out ways to 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 make money because that's what I was watching on TV. And so growing up in that kind of household, thinking that everybody was like me, um, I didn't know how much of a role it played in my life until I got older. And I was like, yo, like, this is crazy because my, my, my childhood has literally conditioned me into the life where I don't know why I'm still broke after 10, 15 years. Right. How come I don't love myself? I actually, I hate myself. And people are literally telling me, man, I'm trying to get like you. I'm like, I, I want to die right now. And so literally my whole entire shaping and molding of my childhood just produced a person in me that was very insecure, broke, which is only a mindset, uh, lackful thinking, gossiping, uh, held on to resentment, didn't know how to apologize, all of those things. And so that was just me. And I'm wondering during all of that time, why is this, why is the same thing keep happening to me over and over and over? Keep attracting the same kind of girl, still keep having no, no money in my, like, I, no matter how much money I would get, it would always go down to the same amount. 
it was like there was a bottomless pit inside of the bank. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the same things would happen. Uh, my phone screen would crack, car wrecks, and things just keep smashing. Like I was just being this, uh, like the waves crashing to life. And the worst part about it is I had no idea. So while I was growing through life, later on I'll tell you why I say growing through instead of going through it. But while I was growing through life, I remember like yelling out to God, why does it feel like I'm living 15, 20 different lives? Cause I was, when I was 17, I was a stripper, like been shot at before, seen somebody murdered in front of my face. Father was a drug dealer, father was killed, been to prison for two and a half years. There was all these things. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Houston, Texas. So there's all these things um, that happened to me, but I had no idea. I just thought, this is how life is supposed to be lived. Until I actually started reading books later on and being around empowered people, driven people, goal-driven people. Then I saw that there was a difference because everybody I grew up around, we were all the same. Then I saw there was a difference. I'm like, wait, hold on. That's something I ain't never seen that before. That's possible. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah. you, mean, you mean to tell me they're not lucky? I thought they were lucky my <laughs> whole life. Right. But I didn't see who they were, how they were, how they responded to people. I never thought to pay attention. I was just so negative whenever I would see sex, successful people or, or just people that like had a lot of stuff going on in life. And so I'm like, oh, they're lucky. That man, that's man, this dad gave him this, a silver spoon and everything I could possibly think of. But all my friends that were broke, we were saying the same things and recycling broke conversation. And so when I actually saw that, John C. Maxwell, he says, successful people are willing to do the things that unsuccessful people won't do. And in that moment, I was like, well, this person is reading this book and I don't. So what if I actually start doing what I've never done before and could that same thing happen to me? So in that whole process, which I was unaware of, there was this time where my life, it just kept getting worse and worse and can it get any worse? And then it's like all this crazy shit would happen. How old were you at that time? I was. 32 years old. You know, like when you get to yeah. past a certain age, it's like, it's over. Right. I had put on an extra 40 pounds to so eat my emotions, feeling bad for myself, blaming the entire world, blaming the president, blaming the weather, <laughs> right. blaming my mom. My dad died when I was 11, blaming him. How did he die? I know that was a rough situation too, right? He, Your dad he was murdered. Yeah, he was murdered. Um, Cops didn't do anything about it because that was the normal in Third Ward, Texas. That was just normal. I even blamed him. And they don't give parents a blueprint on how to raise kids. He did the best he could. All he knew was drugs. All he knew was that. So throughout that whole process, there was a buildup on my life. Can it get any worse? And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And August... 2011, 3.43 in the morning, I'm on the corner of La Brea and Hollywood, and it was after I had just got my, my mom got my car out of the impound. Somebody broke in my car at the freaking, my safe haven was uh, LA Fitness, that's where I would take a shower every morning because I was living in my car. I parked my car at LA Fitness, and somebody broke into my car. I'm like, so I'm literally saying, I don't want to say, can it get any worse anymore? Because every single time I say, can it get any worse? My life keep, just keeps getting worse. And this was the day after you got out of the impound, right? This is what, no, this was the day I got it from the impound. Wow. So this was like thing after thing, thing after thing. Thing after thing after thing after thing. 3.43 in the morning. And that's when I was just, yeah, I call it my moment of awakening. And I just yelled out and I was just like, okay, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. 
I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. And I just want to inspire people to show me a sign. And I want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in, that I would do for free. Just show me a sign. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. I didn't know at that time what was happening. I didn't know that because I said I kept saying, can it get any worse? I didn't know I was causing worse things to happen in my life. Because I was always, you get in life what you focus on, mostly. This was the first time in my life, which I was unaware of. First time in my life, I focused on what I wanted and I was clear and how I wanted to feel. Feeling is the secret. Remember that you guys, feeling is the secret. And so when I was saying, I'm tired of fighting, I don't want to fight anymore. That was my moment of surrender. I felt like the universe took everything from my life, like everything, like my girlfriend, my daughter, my family, my money, my business opportunities to the point where I had nothing. But now connecting the dots, looking backwards on my life from that place of nothing, and I yelled out, I yelled what I was creating as a possibility. Uh, and so now I was living into the possibility of my future rather than recreating more of the past. I didn't know. So a week later, I'm at the gas station with my last $2. And how old are you at this time? Say it again. How old are you at this time? 32. 32 this years old. All the same. There's a bunch of stuff happening at the same time. So this was a collection of my childhood and all these things that happened. And now it finally came to a head. Still 32. I go to the gas station with my last $2. And homeless guy walks up to me and he asked me for money. Typical. He had more money than I had. And I said, I said, you have more money than me. And he said, change your mindset, change your life. And it was like his pupils changed. He was like, change your mindset, change your life. Change your mindset, change your life. Change your mindset, change. And he starts walking away. But that was the first time in my life a set of words stopped me in my tracks. It's like a conscious interrupt. And in that moment, I felt like my whole life was a lie because all I knew was all I knew, but I'd never heard, boom, change your, change your mindset, change your life, change your mindset. So if my mind is set on something, then that's why the result is what it is. So, so if I do different with the same circumstance, then my life will change, which meant, if it didn't make sense to me, and I was trying to make sense to everything else according to how I saw life, that's why my life was where it was. So it was important for me to do things that I wouldn't normally do. And I didn't know. So I started taking the stairs when I would normally take the escalators, using bar soap instead of using gel soap. I joined a, a direct sales like health and nutrition company. That was something I would never, direct sales, hell no. It's a scam. Like, but that's, 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 that's how broke people talk. So you started doing the opposite of what you would normally do. That was part of the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Listening to people was part of the opposite. Being Purchase mentored, be yeah. reading, right. Reading, getting a mentor, purchasing my first suit. Because anything that I would do, I would try to make it make sense according to the only way I knew how to see life that was through my lens. But I wasn't happy. So obviously my choices is what had me where I was. And so by doing different, then that was expanding upon who I was. It was like the person says, well, I'm not me. That's not me. I don't do this because of that. I don't, well, math wasn't you until you learned math. Right. You were open to the process of growth. And so inside of, encapsulated inside of that, it's been six and a half straight years where every single day, something I don't wanna do, I do it anyways. And now that becomes my pattern in this habitual nature where people carry out their childhood habits to their death and wonder why nothing happened. They don't live the life that they want. They gave up on their dreams in childhood and settled in a life of what everybody thinks that you should do. When I did the opposite, I got back to me. So in losing myself, I found myself. 
incredible. Now, when we look back at your childhood, so you grew up in Texas, right? Yeah. So from Texas as a kid till 32, what were some things you got into? Were you always a hustler? Were you always, um, you know, in sales? Because obviously you built a, a multi-million dollar uh, net worth and have done amazing things in business and real estate development and all sorts of other stuff. But talk to me a little bit about what you were like as a kid, right? Now, I know things were not going as well all the time. Yeah. But you had some hustles growing up, right? Selling candy. Talk to me a little Yo, bit about I, how, who man, planted the seed in, in the fact that you got to go get it if you want something. Yeah, now knowing what entrepreneur, uh, entrepren- what an entrepreneur is, I was an entrepreneur when I was like five. <laughs> and I'll tell you, here's what happened though. My mom would always, because when you grow up in a household, we ain't got no money. My mom was like, well, whenever you make your own money, like, you can buy whatever you want to buy. And so at five, I had my own lemonade stand. <laughs> and I would stand at the end of the block, and it would be, my mom used to make fun of me, so it would be like dirt and stuff and then and Kool-Aid. <laughs> we would pour like a half a pound of sugar right. in there and then pour different uh, flavors in there and make the Kool-Aid. But I would sell the Kool-Aid, and I had people working for me. Oh, yeah, working like for me, not with me. Working for me. And they were older kids. Because they wanted to make some money. So from my money, I would just dish them out and they would get the people and everything. I was five. Do you know? Do you remember how much you were selling the lemonade for? For a dollar. Yeah, just a cup for a dollar. Yeah. Yeah, I was selling it for a dollar. And it was little bitty Dixie cups right there <laughs> for a dollar. Yeah. And I had the stand and everything. And simultaneously, I used to wash everybody's car. I would go literally door to door, can I wash your car? They would say no. and Because my, uh, I used to mow the lawn at five and six and seven. And so I would go and I was like, well, can I mow your lawn? And I literally would not take a no. And I was like, well, can I do this? Well, can I? It was always a, yeah, like, something. What can I do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, so between the lemonade stand, the mowing the lawn, my mom was like, so funny. She was like, you used to mess everybody's yard. <laughs> you used to mess everybody's yard up. But I didn't know that that was like a little entrepreneur. I just know when somebody tells me I can't have something, I was gonna go get it. And my mom, and I love her, I love her to death. She didn't know that that was a challenge for me. I remember, I remember when I was 13 years old and the white patent leather Jordans came out with the baby blue bottoms, 150, 100, like $149. I was like, mom, mom, can you buy, buy me these Jordans? She was like, for $149? That's how much rent costs, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and uh, she was like, well, when you can afford for $149, you can get your own Jordans. And I was like, bet. So I went to the rec center. By the way, Mo City Rec Center, I apologize. <laughs> I was the one who broke it, broke into the rec center. But um, <laughs> I broke into the, the, the concession stand and I and I stole like the Snickers, the, the gum, the blow pops, the pixie sticks, sell them for a dollar. And I went to school the next day and I was hustling candy. I was like literally hustling candy, <laughs> pixie sticks, took. everything. And I made the money in one day. Very next day, the patent leather Jordans was coming out. I skipped first period. Oh, I was bad as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped first period, and I was one of the first people in line, and I got the patent leather Jordans. Ooh, yeah. Fresh Jordans, baby. <laughs> Went to school, and I became popular because of the shoes I had. <laughs> Just like that. Yeah, just like and that. And that was your first taste of like, all right, if I want something, I can earn it, right? Like yeah. that's what planted the well, seed. Well, I didn't know the word earn. If I want something, I'm gonna get it. That's just what it was. Period. It's like, yeah. If I want something, I'm gonna get it. Nice. And then how did that translate after? Because I know after you were involved in things you probably shouldn't have been involved with. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that tough time and, and maybe what you learned there? Yeah, so I've always been the kind of person that just do it. You know, I, I would, I would always find a way to make money. Like they have this, this, uh, this, this golf course in Missouri City, and then there's a lake called Alligator Island, but that's where all the golf balls are. Like there's other lakes, but other kids would would get all the golf balls from the lakes. Like literally, swim in a dark lake. Pick a ball. No, but this is what I would do. I would take a a, a large plastic bag because if you get caught, you get fined. So I'd take a large plastic bag and it would look like a piece of trash and I would swim down to the bottom of the freaking lake, get the golf balls and come back up in, in, the, in the plastic bag. And so I would go, I was the only kid that would take a risk 
and go jump into Alligator Island where there was it was infested with alligators and that's why it had all the golf balls. And so ah. I jumped into Alligator Island all the time and, you and risked you, my you life. You weren't scared or you just Yo, weren't even thinking? I wasn't thinking. Yeah. If I was to do that now, hell no. <laughs> but right. it, was a, it was something when I was a child, I didn't care. I was just focused, like, how am I gonna get that money? I was <laughs> yeah, like, I yeah. need four golf balls. I know all the golf balls are down there. Yeah. None of the kids were winning there. But I would, that kind of pattern, me breaking into cars, I was breaking into 60 cars in one night. One time I got caught, and then I was on probation. I got caught again. I went to, to juvenile for six and a half months did the whole scared straight thing, all that crazy stuff. Kept doing that and I just didn't, I didn't know how to stop. Where did you get that seed of persistence or relentlessness? Cause it seems like to some degree you always had it. Did you get it from your pops or where did you pick up that, that, that hustle? You know what, my mom has been a hustler. I would be like, mom, can we have this? She was like, I don't have the money. And somehow my mom would always find a way to have the money. I don't know how. I mean, I know how, but she would just <laughs> always find a way to have the money right. to make sure that her, her boys were eaten. They had food. And even though our, all of our clothes came from garage sales, we still had clothes on our back. I didn't appreciate it until I got older. You know, because my mom, you didn't do this. Why do we have right. to have these kind of, at least we had a rooftop. Right. At least we had food, you know. And, but she would always find a way to make something happen. So just by my mom's nature of just making whatever happened to happen because she would never let her, me and my brother Anthony, go without. I didn't appreciate it like I do now, but just that was the ingraining of, I'm gonna find a way to make it happen in one or two days. No matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then from 13, you get the Jordans, and now you got the confidence. Ah, okay, I can, I can go get it. I can set an intention, I can go get it. Well, so, I wasn't saying words like intention back then. Right, but it was in effect. Yeah. It was in effect. And it so, was, I'll put it to you this way. As a baby can, can go ga-ga-goo-goo, and it's, it's, and it's uh, um, expressing itself, back then, I was ga-ga-goo-goo <laughs> with intentions. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're moving towards it. You just didn't know you were at some right. subconscious level. So from your early teens to your 20s, how does that go? Are you still hustling? Okay. Are you trying out jobs? I mean, talk to me a little about what that period's like. I became a great liar to fit in with people. And I used to be like, oh, I'm a Tommy Hill figure model. Oh, I have to go take my pictures. And people were like, stop lying. And I would just lie about all this stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna move to California and we're moving to California, and I would just keep lying. I was like, yeah, you know, I was on, <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was on this TV show, and, and people, I became like this guy who lied about everything. And you'd never been on a TV show, never been no. on? No. Zero. No, not, not at that time. <laughs> yeah. Not at that time, but it was so funny. You know, I told you how the baby goes gaga goo goo. At that time, I would tell myself, I know you know where this is going, I would tell myself the lie so much that I actually started believing it, that I was a model at like 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say all of these things and people were like, oh, he's such a compulsive liar, I don't, I don't believe him. But I would say it and I would believe it. Every single thing I lied about happened later on and that was <laughs> my first birth of creating intentions and manifesting. So I was like, I was like the biggest liar, but in the liar and the belief in what I say, all of this stuff started happening. So from that, but I didn't see that until I got older. Right, connect the dots looking backwards. Yeah. Exactly. And so, cause you can't see the picture while you're in the frame. And so uh, then, so from that 13 all the way up into my, my 20s, Something told me at a young age, move away. It's like that little voice inside, move. And anytime I would ever tell somebody, oh, I feel like I just need to move away from here. They're like, no, you have a girlfriend, your family's here. And it was like these people, and it was like they were talking me into staying. But the voice would always say, move. So when I, the first sign I had to graduate, I was running track. 
in Kansas, because uh, I thought that that was the, uh, when it says move away, I was like, I'm, I'm going to move away. I moved to Kansas to be in a place I just felt like I needed to be in a place that was totally different than the one that I was in. Because I, where I came from is like a breeding ground for talented people that never really do anything with their life. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and of course people who did, but it was the people who moved away. Who ended up actually doing you know something what I'm saying? with the it. The bird doesn't know how far it can fly until it actually leaves the nest. And so, and our school was in the eye of a tornado. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is the same shit I was getting back at home. <laughs> I feel like I need to go somewhere where nobody knows my name and everything is different. And something just kept saying, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And somehow or another, I got myself kicked off the track team. <laughs> and I ended up going to Los Angeles without a plan. How old were you? 18. And you just took the bus or flew? Yeah, or? no, no, I took a Greyhound. Greyhound to LA, no plans. No plan. Get here, what do you do? You're, now you're like, all right, I'm gonna become a multimillionaire or not even thinking that big no, at that time? not even close. Get here, run track. I have a cousin that I was staying with, but I didn't really know him. I see, <laughs> it's like one of them cousins that you see when you're like three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I see him and I was like staying with him. Gotcha. And everything, so we were like, we knew each other, but not really, yeah, only yeah. through pictures yeah. that were 30 years and, old. And stories or something I mean, like, like that, yeah. 15 years old. Um, but then there was like a falling out, like quickly. And they were going to, uh, him, him and his roommate were going to, uh, to this like Grammys after party. And I was mad that I couldn't go. And they thought I stole the, the after party tickets because I couldn't go and they didn't have any other tickets. So he's like, if you don't find those tickets, get out of my house. And I, I have a in the past, I had an issue with people blaming me for stuff that I didn't do. So I was like, I don't know where the fuck I'm gonna go. Like, and so I just left without a plan. Like I left his house. That's the only person I knew in Los Angeles. And then I had just started at uh, Santa Monica Community College. And I had these two uh, Japanese ro uh, roommates, uh, not roommates, but uh, these two uh, Japanese girls that were in my class. I was like, look, I have nowhere to go. They're like, you can come stay with us. And they were cooking rice for me every single yeah. day. And we were like all sleeping in the same bed. And it's just like I, the way that they were taking care of me, I was like, I had never been taken care of like that. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? Are you hungry? One of them lost their student visa because she lost her student visa. She had to leave. She had to leave and went back to Okinawa. And then the other one left. And by that time, I was the AM manager at Bally's Total Fitness which is basically you hold the keys to open up the club. So I would open it up an hour before a shower and everything. And that time I was living in my car. And I was just living, trying to figure out life. I had no plan. All my bags were, because I was living in my car two times in my life. All my bags were literally in my car. So I was going to girl's house, to girl's house, to my car, my car, my car. And then there was a lady named Shannon Davidson that I met while modeling. When did you start modeling? It was during that whole time. So I was like, I don't have any money. So crazy, I don't have <laughs> any money. Mind you, I'm five foot nine. Right. Talking about I'm gonna be some model, right? <laughs> but somebody, one of, one of the girls said, oh, you should, go, um, you should go audition to become a model. I didn't even know that I said I was gonna be a model when I was a little kid. So you should audition to become a model. Then there was three agencies. There was like the hardest ones to get into. There was like Q, Ford, Wilhelmina. I put them last and I put the top 12 easiest first. I had no car. Four days, I got rejected. They're like, oh, you're too short. We already have somebody like you. Mind you, I had no abs. I wasn't, the, the required height for the male models was six foot one. Right. I come in at five foot eight and a half, five foot nine, no abs, no model clothes, no photos. I'm black, I'm an African American. And during that time, there's only, they get one dark skinned guy, one light skinned guy, that's it. So all the agencies already were like, they already had those models. Right. So mind you, my insecurity was nobody looks like me. 
And I was like, man, I just, I just never, I don't know why I listened to this stupid person to go and do this. So over the next four days, I went and I got rejected four times a day. Normally, you stop after the second rejection. Right. But this little voice inside said, you come this far, keep going. So I get rejected by all the easy ones. Mind you, I didn't have a car. So what it takes to wait for a bus, catch the bus, then go and walk to whatever the address is, was like hours upon hours. So this was a wow. all day process. Yeah, yeah, and you're going physically in there and saying, hey, can I model? No, no they have these things called open calls. Gotcha, okay. Where you go in for the open calls and there's like 50 models getting rejected or taken. <laughs> and each one was like, we already have somebody that looks like you. You're too short. You're too short. We have somebody that looks like you. I had no poor, I didn't have anything that anybody else had, nor did I look like anybody. Everybody looked like Tyson Beckford in every shade of color. Right, yeah. You get to the last day. I get rejected by Q. I get rejected by Ford. And I'm like, hell no. Wilhelmina is definitely going to reject me. They got Beyonce. They got David Beckham. They got all these top models. Of course they're going to reject me. I don't, I don't look like anybody. And that was my story. I'm like, I'm just so, so deathly afraid. There was a cattle call with like easily 60 people. Cattle call is just a bunch of people that's waiting to get picked up by the agency. I went there, not only did I get rejected over the last three days, I get in there and I'm one of the last people and I'm watching everybody get rejected in front of me and they're giving them tops less than a minute. They're looking, thank you, thank you, out, rejection, 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 rejection. I get up, walk out, go downstairs. Something says, you've come this far. Just stay till the end. So you actually left. You're about to leave. I left. I was like. And oh. something in you just wouldn't let you. Yeah. Say, you know, so I'm watching people who wow. I think are perfect looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get rejected. I'm like, if he got rejected, <laughs> I got no I'm chance. definitely getting rejected. Right. I go back up there. Rejection, rejection, rejection. Third to the last person. I'm like, I get up to walk out again. And that little voice says, just stay. And I stayed. Rejection, rejection, rejection. I'm the very last person. And all of a sudden, little bitty gay dude uh, named David Todd was like, hmm, hmm. What I'm saying in my head is this lasted longer than a minute. Right, right, right. Hmm. He's like looking at me. He's like, interesting. I'm going to take your portfolio. I mean, I want to take your Polaroid. Took a pol Polaroid, my bird chest. You know what I'm saying? I had a little bit, had little pecs, little something, something. Not like it's now. We superhero status now. <laughs> uh, but what happened was, in my head, I said, I don't look like anybody. And when he got to the Polaroid, he was like, sure, we would love to represent you. You don't look like anybody. No way. And I, and, and I didn't want to like react. But in my head, I'm like, what the f <laughs> The yeah. very thing that I feared <laughs> right, right. was the very reason why they hired somebody who was lower than their height. Yes. They already had the light skin and the dark skin. But since I didn't look like anybody that was on their wall, they hired me. And then the very same day, we was going to send you on three auditions. The Skechers campaign, Buckle campaign, and the Beyonce, uh, the, the jumping, jumping video for a lead. And I was riding a bus so I can only make the Skechers and the Buckle campaign. I didn't even make the jumping, jumping video campaign. I, I, I mean, the uh, music video. I woke up the very next day and David goes, today's your lucky day. You booked all three of them. No way. I'm like, I was like, even the jumping, jump, knowing that I didn't go on the audition. Right. Even the jumping, jumping video. He was like. Yeah, Beyonce just happened to stop by. No way. She looked on the no the uh, she looked on the wall yeah. and she personally handpicked your card and said, "I want him to be my lead." And then uh, a week later, I shot the Destiny's Child jump and jump and video as the lead in that video. Eighteen years old, young and supple, <laughs> young and supple, and they paid me forty four thousand dollars for that job, two thousand dollars for the buckle job, 
$2,000 for the Skechers campaign. And just like that, $9,000. The question is, who would go through all of that adversity, all of that rejection, all of that insecurity to get to the very last powerful yes. Earn your powerful yes. And through that, I started growing. I didn't know. Shaping and molding and growing and strength and strength and strength. Yes. And it, sh it like created a ripple effect and all of that. Simultaneously, I was reading a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Where did you first pick up that book? A lady named Shannon Davidson, who was a runway coordinator in the industry that I never thought that I would be in, the modeling industry, who gave me a book for my birthday. And I was like, mind you, I grew up, like I was in special needs classes when I was a little kid. And so I, I had delayed learning. So it would normally take you four days to learn. It would take me six months to learn. And so reading was a very difficult thing for me. So I'm like, why would somebody give me a book? And it changed how I thought about her. I actually didn't like, I was like, you give me a book for my birthday? You got all this money? I was just so ungrateful. <laughs> right. One day, I was so, because I used to speak with an impediment. Funny, I'm a global speaker now. So I used to talk like this. One day I was so insecure. I mean, I was so fed up with being insecure of clamming up in my shell when I would hear people speak eloquently or hear people speak big words or with passion. I could never do that. That I started reading The Power of Positive Thinking, not knowing that I'm reading a, this is a transformational book. I'm just reading because I want to, oh, it's the book that I have. And I was over enunciating every word like this. And I was like, today I'm going to, by the time I finished reading the book, I was talking like this. And I was like, ooh. I stretched myself. And inside, and that's a whole nother concept. I stretched myself so much that it went, when it went back to its normal position, my new normal was a whole different person. Simultaneously, I was reading a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, not knowing that the meditating that I'm doing, the saying that um, I can do all things through which Christ strengthens me every single day that I'm doing. I'm just doing it, all the activities that are in the book. I'm not knowing that it's causing all these things to happen. So all the modeling gigs, everything, I did, I did Tommy Hill figure. And you're just tripping out how all this is happening, right? You just and I don't, believe I don't, it, yeah. but I don't line it up. I don't line it up with all the things that I lied about when I was a little kid, being a Tommy Hill figure model, until I connected the dots looking backwards. But I did Tommy, Gap, Old Navy, L'Oreal hair. I was doing all kind of music videos. You started making money. Yo, I started making so much money. And you weren't used to it at that time, right? No. In your 20s, yeah. I was spinning it and all kind of stuff. Stop reading the book. I stopped reading The Power of Positive Thinking. How old were you when you first read it? 19. And, 18, 19. And I know since then you're famous for having read it how many times? Now 315 times. You've read the whole book cover to cover. Cover to cover. Whether, uh, cover to cover and the audio book. Over and 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 over. Do you find that you get new insights every time or they hit you in a new way? Or what is it that makes it so important? Well, the thing about it is most people read books and then they have a couple of quotes. But the information, their life doesn't look like the information that's stored in their brain. So the issue is not that you can't read the book. The deal is. Most people unconsciously get satisfaction off of committing something to memory instead of committing something to mastery. Wow, that's profound. So as I was reading and 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 reading, like somebody listening to a song over and over and over and over and they're singing the song, doing the dance, it's all the unconscious that's controlling the conscious. 
I was reading and reading and reading and reading. So whatever was in the book was causing me to be that book and everything that was going through this. So the power that I was living by was anything that had to do with gratitude, grace, serenity, uh, abundance, everything, because that was all that was in the book. And I just kept doing it. So I don't discover something new out there. I learned something new about myself that's been there the whole time because you can't change without awareness. So it just kept opening me up. And I'm like, but every time I stopped reading it, that's when my life started crashing. So, so then we're in our 20s. You start making more money than you've ever made before. Yeah. We're talking six figures, multiple six figures, give or take. Yeah, and modeling and acting. Yeah. And modeling and acting. You're in your 20s. And then I know you had a situation where you, I think it was like a half million dollar record deal, right? Because you were into music as a producer. This is before I went to, that, that was after I went to prison. Ah, so, so now the question is, how can somebody that's making all this money and making all these headways, why would they do something like that and end up in prison? So what did you do that winded you up in prison? Because I never had money before. I was willing to do anything to get it. And it didn't matter how I got it. So if I found easy ways to make money, I'll do it. Whether it was selling drugs, whether it was steal stealing from people, and I had an opportunity one time where somebody said, if you drive this car, mind you, I had billboards going on. I was in all these magazines, commercials, <laughs> everything, but I was so greedy for money, the greed for money. I put money over everything. I would sell you out in a heartbeat. Money over everything, because that's what I saw on TV. Music videos, society. They say money is the root of all evil. People are the root of all evil. Not the money, it's a piece of paper that perceived value that you give meaning to. I didn't know this. So by my greed for money, I was willing to do anything to make more of it. More and more and more, more and more and more and more and more. So I'm driving the car. What, what's in it? Huh? What's in the 6 car? 6.2 kilos of heroin that I don't even know. Don't ask, don't tell. So you just didn't want it on your conscience? Didn't Not at all. It? So I'm literally doing what I know is something bad, not looking, driving, go over the border, get passed. Go over the border, I drive, they pay me in pounds. And at that time, the US dollar was $2.1 per one pound. They gave me 4,000 pounds to go and do that drop. I did it seven times, more, more, more. More, 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 more. One time they had me go to France. I went to France. I did it again. Everything about it felt wrong. That feeling. Stop, stop. It's like the universe saying stop and getting louder and louder and louder. Get to the border. First time they ever, seven, seven times they never stopped me. Just pass through. Oh, I'm a model. I'm in this. Eighth time, we need to x-ray your vehicle. And I thought about everything. My daughter, who was young, she was like one. All the stuff I had going on. And I knew in that moment my life was over. I knew in that moment my life was over. How old were you at that time? 23. 23. There's a lot of stuff that happened in a short period of time. Yeah, I can tell. Like 22, <laughs> 22 23. No, I was 22. So I'm literally in a holding cell with somebody with broken English telling me you're going to go to prison for a long time. So they search the car, they x-ray it, they find the stuff. They find the stuff. No, but it was the Congo drums. I never knew what was in the Congo drums. I just knew that it wasn't good. Yeah, yeah. They open up the Congo drums. They pull out these little yellow bricks. Soon as I saw the brick, that's when they put the hand, soon as they opened it up and cracked it open, because the, the Congo drums were originally hollow. So they, whatever they did, they put it on the inside of the hollow Congo drums. Cracked it open, pulled that out. My heart, everything just sunk. It was like, and I was like, my life is over. Because all I could think about was what I see on, what I see on TV, what jail was like, what prison was like.
I'm like, damn, I could fight my ass off, but like 15 people coming after me trying to take my manhood. I don't know about that. Right. So what am I going to do? This was like American barbaric prison. And, I, and it was, uh, so that was you what. Didn't speak the language at that time. No. So I was deathly afraid. Of course, all this going for you, your family, your daughter, momentum, Over. just like that. Over. All for what, 4,000 4, euros or 4,000 bucks? Wow. <laughs> I'm just like, man, I'm fucked. Yeah. And I remember they put me in the holding cell. They put me in there for five days. And I got these little square uh, sandwiches. And it was just one like little, one little piece. I didn't get to brush my teeth. Like hardly got to use a bat. Like literally they were trying to, how can I put it? Um, just force me to tell who gave me the drugs, where the drugs came from, tell the person, tell the person. I was like, I ain't about to lose my life for nobody. I never said anything. Right. And um, I'm sitting there looking at a video of me with the people. And I said, that ain't me. And I don't know who that is. Deathly afraid. And then they put me in. Soon as I got there, for some reason, I felt like everything was going to be okay. Really? Soon, it was like the yeah. weirdest feeling. It's like I got there, something said, you're going to be okay. And then that eased me. That eased my spirit. So I'm in prison for all of this time. I'm in there for a whole year before I get sentenced. This, what I'm about to share, is going to blow people's minds. While... I was in there, it's like watching the clock. You watch the clock, you watch the clock, and time just goes by. It seems like it goes so slow. Nobody was writing me back. And I'm writing all these people, my friends, nobody's writing me back. So I'm like, man, I just gotta I, I figure out how to. It was in that moment where I found out that I could only make, only nobody's coming to save me. I can only make myself happy. How many because years nobody's were you sentenced coming. to? Huh? How many years were you sentenced? So I was there for a whole year, and then they sentenced me until 2014, back in 2003. 11, almost 12 years. 12 years. So in my head, I'm not getting out. Yeah. So while knowing I'm not getting out of prison, I remember saying to myself, what can I do in here that I wouldn't normally do out there for the time to pass? I just want to get the time to pass. Right. I started reading and reading and reading and reading and reading, read over 275 books. Anything? Any topics? Anything, bro. Just to take your mind off the fact that Anything. You're I read a lot of books that was based off of using your imaginations, but I read the Bible cover to cover eight times. I read the Quran cover to cover eight times. I, I, I started learning Braille. I started uh, learning sign language, but they were all in the books, like anything that would keep my mind. <laughs> right, yeah. I stopped using my right hand, which was my non-dominant hand, and I started using my, uh, I mean, which was my dominant hand. And I started using my non-dominant hand, which I didn't know at the time, was exercising a different part of my brain. And I started writing letters home with my left hand to the point where I got my left hand better than my right. And so because I was working on these acute senses, it actually made my right 10 times more efficient. Did you notice shifts in your brain as oh, well? Your intellect like, developing from stuff so like that? So here's the thing. When you're not aware, you can't point it out. So that's why I keep saying where I didn't know at the time because I wasn't aware of all these, uh, these things. I just know that when I started using my left hand, that's when I became more creative. That's when I started singing again. But simultaneously, I was reading the power of positive thinking. How ironic. The consulate goes, we think you might like this book. And it was the power of positive thinking. I never knew that the information I was reading is what caused my life to go up like that before. Right. I'm just reading. And I was like, oh, I've read this book before. So I'm reading, using my non-dominant hand, got back to everything that I love. I'm singing. I'm doing, I take the art class. I'm all, in, all in jail. All in prison. Prison, yeah. Yeah. 23 years old. 23 years old learned how to 
memorize my dreams in specific detail. Usually you wake up from a dream and you forget after five seconds. Right. I could wake up 30 minutes later, I knew my dream. It was like practicing a muscle. Crazy thing is, is I have a stack of dreams downstairs. Half of those dreams is the life that I'm living right now. Like word for word, but in different times, and in medieval times. And including this beautiful house, because a lot of people who aren't watching, if you saw the B-roll and some clips that will play, over the audio here, you'll see that he literally designed his home to be an inspirational mecca, right? Like yeah. um, all these quotes on the walls, inspiration. Why is that so important for you? And how did you conceive it in prison? Well, all of those words were words that had me shift. Once I was able to connect the dots, going backwards, I was like, oh, I remember that word. But going back into the prison, I'm in there not knowing that I'm going to get out. So I just keep on doing stuff. I just know I feel good. I'm not even thinking about time. Right. While I was creating, pay attention, while I was creating and doing what I loved and taking what I loved and making people happy and bringing joy to their lives, I didn't think about my current circumstance. And so while I was doing that, then we got to watch uh, Shawshank Redemption. We got to watch movies once a month. That came on. Anthony Robbins, he goes, they can take everything away from me. They can't take away my mind. As long as I have my mind, then I'll always be free. As long as I'm doing everything that I love, then I'll always be free. In that moment, I said, I'm a free man. I literally said, I'm a free man. And that's when it hit me. When I was outside of the bars, free, I always used to say, man, I feel like I'm so far from where I'm supposed to be. I just feel like, I don't know, I feel like I'm behind bars or something. I feel trapped to the point where I was far away from where I was supposed to be, trapped behind bars. But while I was behind bars, I got that I'm free because I was doing everything that I loved. I didn't do that out there. As long as I was doing everything that I loved, I was free and I was bringing joy to their lives. I started running when the prison inmates, they're walking around in the yard, stabbing and, and fighting and drug deals and jumping each other. I'm the only one running. Within a month, I had 50 people running with me. It was less fights, less drug deals, less jumping. And I didn't know that what I loved was causing value, value creation. Now here's how beautiful this is. Think about, a, think about a pregnant lady. She's pregnant, something, fetus is growing on the inside and it fills out the space. It's only so much the baby can fill out the space until what was growing on the inside is produced on the outside. True. Unconsciously, I was taking what I love and providing so much value and who I became was positivity. Like I, was the, I wasn't the words, I was the essence of. Even in prison. In prison, I was no longer in prison. The second I said I'm a free man, there was no prison. I wasn't even thinking about when I'm gonna get out. I had given up on that. I was just, man, I was just in it. It was just, a, bird doesn't, a bird doesn't know it's a bird. Alligator doesn't know it's an alligator. But if the bird were to try to be an alligator, you can see how life would be difficult. It's just using everything that's already inside of them. That's why flow happens in its innate nature. So how can people who are listening to this apply that to their life if they're feeling stuck or they feel like they're in a prison of sorts? Maybe they have money, maybe they don't. They're going after their dreams. What have you learned from going from living in your car, things being rough to become multimillionaire, impacting people? What's the takeaway to help people live for you who are watching this looking for answers? I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump with that. But there's this last part of that story that you got to get. Okay. So like the, 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 the lady becomes pregnant, she gives birth to a baby. The value in who I was becoming on the inside grew so much that something had to be produced on the outside, and out of nowhere, Jones, you're getting out next week. The drugs were fake. No way. The drugs were fake. 
So through my lack of awareness, I didn't know. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm lucky. Praise God. Right. But now knowing what I know, it's who I was. The world, the universe is plastic. Right. And it, and it literally flows according to how you see yourself and how you're applying yourself inside of this mind, body, and spirit. So while I was in it, I didn't know Garen. I didn't know I was a black man. I didn't know any of those things because I was so in it. Bird doesn't know it's a bird. So being unconscious to what I, I'm usually conscious of and just instead of focusing on having, I was just being. The drugs that they tested three times, 6.2 kilos of heroin, magically fake, you're free to go home. Just like that. It wasn't until 10 years later till I picked up books, went to seminars, went to workshops, that they helped me to understand and connect the dots going backwards that I'd been guided literally my entire life from childhood all the way up to that time. The only thing I was missing, they were saying leaders are readers and you've got to keep doing it. Like you should take a shower every day, you brush your teeth every day. You do it every day for five years and then stop for five days. You're wondering why it's all messed up. Why, why you, smell why you stink, why you mm -hmm. smell. You take your shower every day. You renew your mind every day and I never knew that. So now it made sense why every time I read the book, read these books, audio books, all this great stuff would happen. I would stop, make it about myself, pride and ego would set in. It's all me, yeah. Me, yeah, me, yeah. me, 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 me. Just as fast as it would rise, just as fast as it would crash. I never stopped reading the book. And so now you understand 320 times. Right. It's not 320 times of the same exact Garen Jones reading that book. I see what you're saying, yeah. It's like the gym almost. You're building the muscle upon the muscle Absolutely. upon the muscle upon the muscle. So every time you read it, you get to a higher and higher Absolutely. level. Absolutely. Yeah. Most people read books and all they have are great words that inspire non-woke people. <laughs> right. But when you actually speak to a woke person, they will have the results in their life. It has to, it's a law. It is a law for your life, the physical equivalent of your life to mirror the thoughts that you give the most power. And when you're really living that life, it has to produce the result. It has to. Period. Period. There is no like, well, you know, it's because, no. Because if it's not there, you're blocking yourself somewhere. And that's why I focus on whole life success, mind, body, spirit, health, every, heart, everything, family whole life success. And you were even talking about something interesting off camera before we started, where you were talking about the importance of health and how you could only experience so much happiness if your health is at a certain point. Only can so you, much. Can you share a little bit about your philosophy on that? You know, you play video games. You can only get so far until you face the dragon. You gotta face the dragon. Once you beat the dragon, you go to the next level. Right. The dragon of most people in the world is they don't understand. They don't understand how important health is in their life. So what they'll do is they'll give, they'll give themselves to the guy, to the money, to the job, to all these other things and leave themselves last. We weren't created to be keepers, we were created to be givers. So if you're not giving to yourself, you've got it all wrong. That's like, hold your breath, keep it. Everybody out there, hold your breath, don't let it go. Hold it for a minute and 30 seconds and watch how uncomfortable it becomes in your body. So if you're keeping your best self from the universe, that's like holding in nature. That's holding in your breath. So your life is going to start looking uncomfortable. Your relationships are going to start looking uncomfortable and things start breaking down and all this kind of stuff is because there's something inside of you. You're holding back your creativity, holding your secrets in, holding your darkness in, holding your vulnerability in, holding all of this stuff in. But that has to do with your, that who you are as a person. Right. So at the core of everything is your health and that's not a focus. I can tell you how your life is going to go off when health is not your first priority, 
I can tell you, anybody can do anything for a little bit. Staying power is what you want. And when you understand nature, you look at all these trees out here, they're going like this. You look at the water, it's going like this. You look at the bird, it's literally in flight in nature. The fish, when we withhold information, information meaning that breath in your body, meaning your best self, that's right. information. You're not a part of nature's design. And that's why things are going to break down. My, like, that's why love will break down. That's why money will break down. You don't understand how money flows. Money is made from trees. So if money's made from trees, then that's energy and oxygen. So if you understand oxygen and you understand energy, money's got to give and go. And that's why giving and receiving is so important. So if the oxygen, I mean, if, if you're withholding yourself, and yourself, your best self, is oxygen, you're stopping the process of nature. And so that's why everything will go wrong in your life. I learned this the hard way <laughs> so that people don't have to go through what I went through. I got a chance to grow through that. But health is so important. That's that center console. That's your, that's your Super Mario Playing Super Mario Brothers, you got that universal star that speeds up the game and you become invincible. I know it. And there's only a certain level of happiness that you can get to if you're not healthy. I have a five-minute conversation. If I know you're not healthy, I can already tell, I can already tell where the self-love, self-care comes in. Because I've been there. I've seen what happened to my mom as she had a year to live. And then we got her healthy. Seven years later, she's still here. Seen what happened to my brother. I seen what happened to thousands of people. And so that became my main focus because I saw inside of my body what happens to me because it affects how you feel. And how you feel affects how you think. How you think affects how you speak. How you speak affects your actions. And your actions affect the outcome. And it's all connected. When you feel bad, anything you put out is going to be from the lens of feeling bad. I give 100%, yeah, from the 2% that you give yourself. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But when I made this my primary focus, my temple, my temple, all this, now people, they benefit from the overflow that I give to myself. Mm. And I don't give from an empty cup. Mm, and it doesn't hurt to give. Oh. You're overflowing, so it's, you have more than enough. No, no. You're abundant. There's so much, I, there's so much I give that nobody even knows about. Mm -hmm. Nobody even knows what I do at my church. I'm one of the highest donors. Like, nobody knows the kind of tips that I leave. And I never even talk about it. But anything that you see in my life out loud is a result of what was given in silence. So let's go to, at 23, you finally are a free man out of nowhere. Yeah. Drugs are fake. You get out. Yeah. Now, when you're in there, what was your plan to, like, what do I do when I get out? So you get out. What's, what's your game plan from there? I said, I'm because I, I, I was writing all these songs. I was making all these beats in my head and everything. And, <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm going to write all these songs. I'm going to get a record deal. I'm going to, like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So you started setting intentions and getting into manifestation at this time, correct? Like this is when you started getting serious, conscious I didn't know they were called intentions, but I just said what I was going to do. There was a power and a surge of confidence mm -hmm. that was, see, when you're in prison, it's way different than being right. out here because you can be distracted by the squirrel uh -huh. and the trees. When you're in prison, all you have is time. And yourself, yeah. That's it. So everything automatically quiets it down. So whenever I would say something, there was no distraction. So I get out, and then I say I'm gonna I'm gonna get a record deal. I'm gonna do, it. and everybody's no like, how. "Yo, you're crazy." No clue how. Okay. <laughs> and I say, "Man, I don't have no songs." I went on MySpace, like I didn't have no friends. What year is this? 2000 and 2005. That was when I, that was my introduction to social media, because while I was in there, social media wasn't popular. 
and I get out and I was like, MySpace, what the hell? I don't talk, <laughs> talk online. Then I remember meeting this one guy who was a photographer named John Henry. And then John Henry, was he heard me humming. He was like, yo, you sing? And so I sang a song. Then I had one song. I put that one song on MySpace. And then all of a sudden, I started hitting up all these people. When I say all these people, I mean massive action. I hit up over 500 people. to get. I didn't have no money like to get free sessions. I took that one song. I played it. I was like, you have enough talent. And so you come in there, and then one thing led to another. And then I had this song, this song, and this next song. Now my, it's my play brother, a uh, guy named D-Ray Davis. He goes, oh, you can stay with me. He was like, rent free. I'll drive you wherever you want to go, pay for your clothes, food, and everything. He was like, you want to sing, right? I'm like, yeah. He said, you can stay here for free. Don't come home unless you have a song per day. So I'll take care of everything. Just make a song per day. Per day. I'm like, <laughs> I don't, you want to sing, right? Right. Yeah. Don't come home unless you have a song. 30 days, I had 29 songs. Two weeks later, I had a $500,000 record deal. No way. Yeah, because he's a comedian, and inside of his, he, 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 every Monday night at the Improv, Ludacris came there. He had me perform on stage, and that's where I met Luda. So you met Luda right there, Chance Encounter. And on Handed him my CD. And you guys hit it off, started talking? Yep. Two weeks later, they signed me to a $500,000 record deal. And you're blown away. Blown away. Oh, I'm lucky. I'm so lucky. Right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Praise God. Same thing. Right. Same thing. But then I, I have this thing about if it don't feel right, I'm not going to do it. So I'm doing it. And they say, we'll sign you for the kind of music that you're making. And then all of a sudden, I was like, this, this don't feel right. I'm, I'm not making the kind of music that I want to make. And, so I ended up quitting the label, and everybody called me crazy. There went, after that, I was like, I'll do it myself, and that went my, my descent. When you, when you left, did you, were you in debt? I mean, did you go in debt or owe them or any oh, kind man. of financial? Not, it was, uh, there was like, there was debt, there was credit card bills, there was all kind of stuff that I just... School loan, like yeah. so much stuff that was just in the ocean. You were I mean, six figures in debt, right, at one point? Yeah, but that was towards 2010. Okay. We're not paying taxes for over 10 years, but you they get you for the last seven. Yeah, it was a compound of all this thing, like everything, and I owe this money. Then there was people I owed money that's off record. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. That's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> yeah. Like when your family is threatened. Right. That kind. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So that's when I was going to end my life. And so really? it was one thing next to another because it's like I got these people on my head threatening me. And I owe them money. Then I got the IRS. Then my girlfriend just broke up with me. Then, like, my mom is pretty much dying in the hospital. Then, like, I'm putting on weight. I was like, fuck. My daughter pretty much disowned me because I couldn't, I wasn't emotionally available for her. There, one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. And that, that was the moment where, and it just kept piling on it, piling on it, piling on it. Just imagine Superman kryptonite and there's like a thousand tons of kryptonite surrounding him in every single area. I'm sleeping in my car. I'm sleeping in abandoned buildings. I'm sleeping in uh, the my storage unit, but I gotta leave by 8 p.m. so the the little big gate don't don't close down. And I'm doing that. And my only source of food is ramen noodles. And I had too much pride to go back home. And that's when I had. Can it get any worse? Can it get any worse? Can it? And the stage before it got any worse. Somebody out of, I don't even know where it came from, 
an anonymous PayPal for $1,400. I believe in you. Keep going. Just randomly. Random. And you still don't know who it was? No. Gonna take this money, go to the municipal court, the, the, the court district, to pay off my 14 traffic tickets. I get one block away from the courthouse. Cop pulls me over, says, you know, your license is suspended, registration is past due, and that's what I was going to pay off. I'm gonna take your car. I'm like, don't take my car. I'm living out of my car, I got my clothes in the back. I'm see, look, I have this wad of money, I'm gonna pay, pay my car. Took my car, left me in Denny's parking lot. And that's in the point where I was like, I don't want to live anymore. Get my car back. And it goes all the way around full circle. I pick up the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Because <laughs> I can't do this on my own. Man. <laughs> I pick up the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And that night, and that's when I had my moment of awakening. I screamed out, okay, okay. Haven't looked back since. And I just kept reading and reading and reading and applying and reading and committing to mastery and reading and breaking through and going to seminars and going to see certain, like get a, getting a life coach and having mentors and observing and reading. And I just kept going. It's like, a, it's like an ant kick over the ant bed and they're doing everything to build the house. I'm doing everything to expand upon Garen. Higher, bigger, quicker, faster, stronger. It doesn't matter what you put in my way. I have so much momentum. So much momentum going on inside of me. I like to call it magnetism. You know, you can take a piece of steel and when it's magnetized, and pick up a car. If it's not magnetized, it won't even pick up a feather. It's all about the charge, not just the vessel. I realize how to charge myself up with affirmations every day, positive words every day, acknowledgement every day, treat, treating people kind every single day. I forgave all, I forgave the two men who murdered my father. Let it go completely. I wrote a list of 250 names from kindergarten up till now, apologize to everybody for any shit I've ever done. Let, all, let it all. This time I was aware of what I was doing. See, I wasn't aware before, so I'm just floating through life. Now, I'm very clear on what I'm doing. I do this, this happens. Now I start teaching it. I start teaching it and sharing it. it starts happening to other people. How old were you that night when you turned it around? in that parking lot, that Denny's parking lot? I was 32. 32 at that time. Yeah. So after you get out from prison, there was a while, almost a decade of oh. kind of up and down. Going and from down. couch to couch to couch to girl's house to couch to girl's house to girl's house to couch to, damn, I'm tired of sex yeah. for sleep. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even want to be touched. I don't, like, listen, I just, I just want to sleep. Yeah. And that is a great pleasure. When you don't want it at all, not even kiss from nobody. Yeah. I just want to sleep. So it was in that moment, 10 years. And I used to say, man, these people are crazy going to school for 15 years, going to, to become a brain surgery. I ain't never doing that shit, ever. When I, when I calculated the time, the amount of time that it took me to figure it out. And you're always figuring it out. Right. The essence of life is growth. And I calculated the amount of time where it was hardship and hardship and hardship, hardship and hardship and hardship, right around 17 years. And I was like, holy shit. I went to school for 17 years to get the big pay. Oh. You will be rewarded in life for the price you had to pay if you choose to wake up. Because if you never wake up, you're going to carry that cycle to your death. Now, 
This is what had me like really change. The last place I lived was in a high rise in Santa Monica oh, on the beach. The youngest person that was there was 75 years old. All I did was ask them questions every day. My neighbor was 103. Everything that they were learning now because they knew death was approaching, I said, I'm gonna apply right now when I'm in my 30s. And I'm not gonna wait until I know I'm about to die to figure out how to be happy. And live wise. And live wise. And I said, everything they're telling me, I said, I'm gonna work on that now. I'm gonna work on it now and I'm gonna teach it now. I don't I ain't even worry about the money. I start worrying about the money and just giving and giving and <sighs> breath. Giving and giving and giving, but receiving at the capacity that I that I give. It's supposed to trade. It's supposed to, money's supposed to go like this. Ebb and flow, yeah. It, it, it's made from trees. Look at the, just look at the trees. Look at the nature. You understand that? You understand this. You understand money. You understand love. It's supposed to go like this. And at 32, you found the vehicle? Is that when you found the vehicle that allowed you to, to build your first uh, sense? My of first wealth? million, yeah, yeah. So I, I uh, my first seven figures within two and a half, within two and a half years, funny, I was in prison for two and a half years. And within two and a half years, I found my first vehicle to earn my first seven figures. And it was through health and wellness. Funny because my girlfriend at the time and my mom, while I was trying to do the music, they were like, you should do something in health and fitness. You love to help people. And I would say, no, I'm gonna get this music. Why don't you do something in health and fitness? You love to help people. Because at that time, at that time I was helping, I was literally helping people for free. At, at, at Runyon Canyon, I'm literally helping people for free. 75 people at the, at the, um, at the Runyon Canyon living in my car. Nobody knew I was sleeping in my car, then going to the canyon. You know, as we go into closing, no, nobody had any idea. So I'm doing these workouts for free. My girlfriend is saying, you should do something in health and fitness. You love to help people. I'm like, hell no, I'm going to the studio. But remember my prayer and my moment of awakening? I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. I want to inspire people all over the world. And I want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in that I would do for free. I didn't even realize that the health and wellness is what I was doing for free because I was so busy doing all this other stuff. And then the second I shifted, my whole entire world opened up. And that was the first trade. And that's when I realized it wasn't even about what you're working in, it's who you are while you're doing the work. Mm -hmm. And who, who I was, was while doing the work is somebody that was generating, that was generating transformation. It didn't matter what it was. You give me a video game, somebody's life was gonna be transformed because of who I'm being. And I put that into real estate development. You know, I put that into to my own company, my own workshops and all these other stuff. And the, the feedback that I get from people that got a gun to their head right now and then watch an interview and they say, I put the gun down after your interview. Now I know a reason for living. Thank you for reminding me of who I am. I get those every day. Every single day. And when you first started with the, the company that allowed you to build your, your vehicle of wealth, was that something that you struggled with at first? Or no, you were in such Hell a good yeah. space that you started attracting it, people? Or? When you don't come from money yeah. and people come to you with an opportunity, all that shit sound weird. And you have limiting beliefs and all that, yeah. Hell yeah. Hey, you want an opportunity? Last time I heard opportunity, I spent two and a half years in a French prison. So the next time I, you know what I'm saying? Right. So the next time I hear opportunity, I'm like, fuck that. Hell no. You know? But you know, it was through that personal development work. You know, when you read a book 300 times, something starts to happen inside of you. It's not happening out there. I'm just reminded of even more of what's been there the entire time. And do you find that that fueled your success economically and personally more so than the actual mechanics of the steps? 100%. So, so it's more about the mindset of how you're being while you're doing than it is sell like this or do this or find people like this. It's, it's a very fine line. I wasn't like 
reading, and then I'm sitting there and be like, praise Jesus. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm just waiting on God. You're going to be waiting until to, to you <laughs> in the ground. Right. Because you've been given the spirit to actually do something with it. Like, I've always been a hard worker. I was like, man, go get that girl. When we was at the clubs, people were like, oh, go get that girl. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go get the girl. Or I'm going to break into the house. I'm going to break into the cars or whatever. I've always been that person, but it was energy that I didn't know where to place. Once I found a vehicle to just place the same energy, I received exponential success because now it was almost got, it was almost like God was like, now you get it, my son. Bring me my children. And as people just started waking up and waking up and waking up, waking up, waking up. I never had to worry about income, nor of my family, nor the people around me. And it's not, I, I wasn't, I stopped focusing on the, on the income. And that's when it started coming in abundance. Yeah. Now, looking back to the, the young Garen that was in the car, homeless, looking for answers, begging, praying, not understanding why things weren't working, compared to the multimillionaire now and the things you're doing to impact and inspire the world, um, what would that, the, the, the Garen who was looking for answers at that time when he was 18, what would the Garen today tell that young man who was looking for answers? And maybe that applies to people watching this who are th themselves looking for answers. What would you tell people about how to find their path, how to find their clarity, how to find their vision, how to find meaningful work that they love, their vehicle? Keep listening to that voice. Every single time something happened in my life, I listen to the voice. We think it's a little voice. It's just surrounded by bullshit. And once you remove the stuff that doesn't serve a purpose in your life anyways, what shows up is a really loud voice, but that's your higher self connected to source giving you the way through your life. And it might not go the way that you want it, but it's going to go the way that's going to shape you and mold you into the kind of person that can sustain at the next level. That's why they don't put first graders in fifth grade. You got to pass tests. And you need teachers, mentors to take you to the next 100%. grade. 100%. You, a fifth grader can't take himself to sixth grade. He needs a teacher to take him to that next level. Absolutely. I've got a life coach right now, Monica Zanz. I see her twice a week, every week. She keep this hot head mind on a swivel. <laughs> now, how do you recommend people cultivate that voice inside? Keep listening to it. It's like a muscle. You, it's. How can you tell if it's actually your intuition or your fear? How do you recognize that it's that? Listen, voice you can listen either. To? This is what I tell people. You can either focus on the fear of loss or the possibility of gain. I say. You see what life looked like when you live in fear. When you don't listen, when you don't trust, and you think about something, if you ain't happy, you might want to try something else. I started saying yes to life. I started saying yes to shit that I would never do in my life. And then I would say yes to this thing I would never do, and then meet this person as I was going to lunch that would lead me to a prayer that I prayed when I was 15. It, it's, right. it's all connected. But you got to start somewhere. Google started in a garage. Start with the little voice. It's been telling you, do this for a long time. Random idea. Create something. Do this. Do this. And then in closing, I, I, before we wrap up, I have to ask you these, these three last powerful questions. For people out there listening that might look at your story and they'd be in their own challenge, yeah. how do they overcome that broke mindset? Not just the broken fitness, not just the broke in terms of their energy, but broke in terms of finances too, like, what is the psychology of being broke? Why do most people live in that? How, what is causing them to stay there? And how can they get out of it? Well, one, it starts at home when you're a little kid. My mama, mama, can we, we ain't had no money. I'm broke. If that's your, as that, if that's your childhood narrative, you still got it right now. And that turns into, I'm not worthy. I, I got to prove a point. I can't find the man or the woman I want. And that, that whole entire conversation follows you from when you were a little kid. So that whole I'm not worthy and all that kind of stuff, I would start listening to different things. I don't know, I don't know who you hanging out with, but if people are like, ah, I'm so ugly, I'm so fat, I'm so <laughs> this, and you keep, that's your radio station, you're gonna be playing that song, dancing to the, to the jingle and uh, whatever of, however people are choosing to talk. Me, yeah. 
you know, the people that I came around, I, I, I stay around little kids. I love little kids. Youthful energy, yeah. Youthful energy. I stay around little kids all the time. I'm like, oh, no, go ahead. I'll babysit them. I'm like, what's your dream? And I'd be asking, <laughs> I'd be talking to them. They'd be saying all this kind of stuff before society gets to them. So whatever you're choosing to listen to, massive action it. Become it. Commit it to mastery. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. That, even if you don't know what's happening, it's automatically going to shift you into something else. I would say just start there because I can speak on so many different levels. However, that's not going to happen. I can speak. I'm going to say something simple. Go to your mirror every day. Tell yourself, I love you. I love your nose. I love my hair. I love my, I love my skin. I love all these different things. You say that over and over and over and over and over and over. Fill up your cup. Take a cup, pour some content in it. The very top, you pour another drop, it'll spill over. Fill up your cup every single day and then allow people to benefit from the overflow of what you've given to yourself. Just start there. I wanna give you pre-calculus. Start there. Start telling yourself a different story. Look at yourself different. Be around people who speak in ways that inspire you. Listen to those things. Turn off your TV, turn off the radio, and take that same time, put that in the books. How about when it comes to clarity? How do you find your clarity or your center? How do you recommend people find their purpose? There's a lot of people out there that have the talent like you know that they have it. They just don't know how to aim it, how to direct it. How you do know, you look at I, that? this purpose is a funny thing. I tell you, I used to look for purpose in women and, and money and girls and saving the children over in Africa. <laughs> but it wasn't until I saw, I saw a tree outside and the tree is just growing as high as it possibly could, producing as much fruit as it possibly could. And it don't even know it's a tree. Mm, it's just living. It's, it's not just trying to get anywhere. inside of its innate nature. The birds fly as high as they can. Alligators do what alligators do. What could life look like if Garen lived to be all that he could be? Fullest expression of himself. Earn all you can. Like everything. The kind of person that goes out after the higher version of himself. I mean, all limbs, everything. It's beyond me, way beyond me. But the kind of person that goes after that, and that's a focus, will be the person that's saving children in Africa, have the girls if you want, the cars if you want, the houses if you want. So when it comes to purpose, see what life could look like if you were focused on being on the fullest expression of yourself. Because I refuse to believe that God put us, put us on this earth to pay bills and die and pass that <laughs> philosophy on to our kids. I ain't got no money. Why am I here? That's my purpose. What if it was you? What if everything you've been looking for your whole life was the person that you look in the mirror every single day? Learn a little bit more about yourself. Now, before I ask the closing question, um, I do want to ask for people out there that might love your work, love the message you're sharing. What are some daily practices or rituals that have really shifted the game for you? You mentioned affirmations. You mentioned looking in the mirror. I know they're probably at, at a certain point second nature to you now, right? It's just sort of automatic. Uh, but what are what are affirmations or, or things that shifted you that somebody could go and apply right now to their own life to, to enhance the quality of their mind, their energy, their sense of connectedness to themselves? Well, the whole purpose of affirmations is to is to tell yourself a more empowering narrative because when you have this dialogue called I've had such a fucked up childhood <laughs> right <laughs> I've had such a fucked up childhood that I don't even know that this little mad ass five-year-old is controlling my life now mm -hmm. as an adult right. so you've literally got to override 20 30 years of speaking one way mm. how would you want to learn another language kind of tap at it or immerse yourself in it right so when you immerse yourself in Affirmations. I would just say start there. Mm -hmm. Affirmations, telling yourself 
I love you, uh, when you're looking yourself in the mirror and doing all those things, something will eventually shift. In ways you can't calculate. In ways you can't calculate. Just start there. And I'm just going to leave it right there because most people don't do that. Now, in closing, uh, I want to ask if you could look into the camera and share everything you've learned, the ups, the downs, the lessons, the wisdom. What would Garen Jones' best 60 seconds piece of wisdom be to the world if we could capture your advice and share it one last time? What would be your best 60 seconds to live the most fulfilling life possible? You will find your answer in silence. You know what to do. I love that. Now in closing, we have a game. It's called First Things First. And the way the game works is basically, I'm going to rifle off 10 words or phrases, and then you tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind in response to that thing. Make sense? Yeah. The only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Ready? All right, number one, the power of positive thinking. Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> Prison. Break. Your childhood. Kylea. Money. Everything. Abundance. Nothing. Energy. Love. Passion. Me. Leadership. John T. Maxwell. Your legacy. Forever. Last one, you ready? Love. God. If you guys enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now because every week we bring you the very best in personal development content, interviews, and insights to help inspire you to take your life and your dreams and make them a reality. And also, if you want to know how to book dream guests the same way I have, you can check the link below for my top three secrets. So if you have a podcast or a show or whatever it is and you want to collaborate with them, if you click that link below, I'll give you those top three secrets to help you get in touch with anybody. And also, don't forget that The Passionate View is available on media platforms as well. So you can subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, thank you for being one of The Passionate Few.